This is Bloomberg Law with June Grosso from Bloomberg Radio. You know, jury selection is largely luck. It depends who you get. Donald Trump is right that luck does play a part in jury selection, as well as a host of other factors considered during four days of voir dire in the hush money trial of the former president. The trial judge, prosecutors and defense attorneys vetted almost 200 prospective jurors to weed out people who might be biased one way or the other. And a jury of five women and seven men has been sworn in to hear the historic case in which Trump is accused of falsifying business records to conceal a sex scandal before the 2016 election. The jury includes a teacher, a software engineer, an investment banker, a speech therapist, a security engineer, a physical therapist, a retired wealth manager, and two lawyers. Joining me to take some of the mystery out of jury selection is former federal prosecutor Robert Mintz, a partner at Carter in English. Bob, before we get to these jurors, I want to talk about jury selection in general. So in this case, they started with a large pool of prospective jurors, and about half said they couldn't be fair and impartial. So right off the bat, the judge dismissed those jurors. Then 18 of the remaining jurors were seated in the jury box, and the prosecution and defense each got a half an hour to question them individually. That's unlike federal court where the judge does the questioning. So tell us, as a trial lawyer, when you're questioning the jurors individually, what are you trying to do? Assess their honesty? Make a connection? What's your goal? Well, what you're trying to do is find jurors who may be sympathetic to your side. So you're looking for every sign that you can about how they might view the case, whether they're going to be rule followers, whether they're going to be somebody who's going to be more guided by their emotions whether they're going to like your client if you're on the defense and if you're the prosecution, whether or not they're going to like the government's case. So it really is much more of an art form than it is a science because jurors don't tell you everything about them and what they say may or may not be true. It really is a bit of luck in selecting a jury. And ultimately, it is a guessing game for lawyers to try to pick jurors and try to make sure they're going to pick somebody who is going to be fair to their respective side. Now to jury challenges. You have four cause challenges for when you think a juror can't be fair or impartial, but the judge has to rule on whether you'll get a four cause challenge. Then you have peremptories, which means you can challenge a juror for any reason, except for reasons of race, sex, ethnicity, and the like. But those peremptories are limited, and in this case... Each side had only 10. How do you decide how to use those? Well, that becomes very tricky. You're looking at this jury pool, and you have your 10 peremptory challenges, which are essentially challenges that you can ask a judge to remove a juror for almost any reason. As you say, you cannot remove a juror based upon their race or ethnicity or some kind of improper reason. But for just about anything else, you don't have to explain why you want to remove them. So you want to use those sparingly. You want to move somebody off the jury if you really think they're going to be bad for your client. But once you run out of your peremptories, then you're basically stuck with that jury unless there is what's called a for-cause reason. And that is much more difficult. That's where you have to convince the judge that the juror cannot be fair. And that is a much bigger challenge. So you guard those peremptory challenges very carefully, trying to save at least one until near the end. So you make sure you're removing anybody you think is going to be not good for your client, but you have something left in case somebody comes along who you really don't like. But eventually you do run out of those, and then you're pretty much stuck with the jury unless you can show that this juror simply cannot be fair to your client. And I think that's what happened to the defense here, because one juror who works in product development said this about Trump. I don't like his persona, how he presents himself in public. He seems very selfish and self-serving. And when the defense lawyer said, it sounds a bit like what you're saying is you don't like him, she responded, yes. And the defense attorney asked for her to be dismissed for cause, and the judge refused, but the defense had no peremptories left. You would use your peremptory for someone like that if you have any left, and that's exactly the type of juror who you would want removed. You don't want somebody sitting on the jury who has told the court that they don't like your client if you're a defense lawyer. But in this case, 
that is not, at least in the mind of the judge, a basis to remove somebody. You're not going to find a lot of jurors who have no opinion about former President Trump one way or the other. And if you use that logic, then somebody who liked him would be removed by the prosecution and anybody who didn't like him would be removed by the defense. So the judge has said there has to be something more than that. If they say that regardless of what their personal feelings are about him as president or as a person, they can put that aside and make a decision about his guilt or innocence based solely on the evidence that's presented at the trial, the judge is going to leave them on the jury. No question that the defense is not thrilled having that juror on the jury, but at that point, they had no peremptory challenges. Let's look at some of the others who were selected to be on the jury. What strikes me first is that there are two lawyers, a civil litigator and a corporate lawyer. And there used to be a time when lawyers weren't allowed to sit on juries because jurors might turn to them as the authority on the law. You know, what do you think? You're a lawyer. Yeah, it's totally uncommon to have even one lawyer sit on a jury, let alone two, because basically, whether you're the prosecution or the defense, you really don't want a lawyer sitting on that jury because they're going to have outsized influence. Other jurors may defer to them. So we really don't know what kind of influence a lawyer could have on the other jurors. And unless you're 100 percent certain that that lawyer is in your camp and that lawyer is going to be favoring your client, whether you're the prosecution or the defense, you don't generally want to put that much power in the hands of one juror. And what you really want to do is make sure that everybody on the jury sort of has an equal say. They all bring their collective backgrounds to the deliberation process rather than having one person who will convince other jurors. But the prevailing view is that two lawyers on the jury might actually benefit the defense more than the prosecution. Because if the defense strategy here is to try to convince jurors that there is a technical error in this case, that this is really just a technical violation, that it really doesn't rise to the level of a crime. A lawyer on a jury may find that more persuasive than somebody who's not a lawyer. So it's possible that these two lawyers may actually help the defense more than the prosecution. But having said that, at the time that these two lawyers were still being questioned by both sides, both the prosecution and the defense still had peremptory challenges left. In other words, Either side could have removed one or both of those lawyers, and neither chose to do it. So what that tells us is that the prosecution and the defense viewed those lawyers in completely different ways. The prosecutors thinking that a lawyer will actually be good for their case, somebody who will follow the judge's instructions carefully, who will look at the facts analytically rather than emotionally, while the defense looked at the same two lawyers and thought they'll be good for the defense because they may be able to cut through the emotion of the case, look at this case as much more of a technical violation that is not sufficient to convict the former president. Several jurors have college educations plus. Two have master's degrees. One has a doctorate. Two, the lawyers, have JDs. Isn't that what the prosecution was looking for? The prevailing view in terms of jury selection going into this case is that prosecutors would be looking for a more educated jury. In other words, they would probably want to steer away from more blue-collar workers. They'd want to steer away from civil servants. They'd be looking for a jury that included perhaps more educated jurors who would look at the case carefully, analytically, who would be able to follow the judge's instructions, because at the end of the day, Following the instructions of the judge is going to be critical for the prosecution if they're going to get a conviction here. So when you look at this jury and you look at the educational background of this jury, you would think that the prosecutors are very happy with these 12 jurors. During the jury selection, the defense spent a lot of time delving into jurors' social media posts, going back years. What do you think the defense was looking for in a juror? Yeah, I think from the defense side, what you don't want is a zealot. You don't want somebody who's politically active. You don't want someone who is going to go into this trial as a way to try to even the score for what they believe to be any kinds of injustices that were committed by former President Trump having nothing to do with the charges here. So I think they were scouring social media. They were asking jurors questions about where they got their news. Did they watch MSNBC? Did they watch Fox News? How much do they know about this case? 
And they basically want somebody who may not know that much about it, who will come to this trial with an open mind and someone who will hear their case. What's going to happen here is we're going to see dueling stories here. We're going to see conflicting stories being told by the defense and the prosecution. The prosecution is going to say this is a serious case. It's not simply paying off former porn stars. This has to do with potential election interference. The prosecution is going to say that this case is all about trying to make sure the public was not aware of these relationships leading up to the 2016 election because former President Trump and his campaign believed that if this became known, that he might lose the election. The defense, on the other hand, is going to paint a very different story for the jury, and they are going to say these are simply technical bookkeeping violations, that this case is politically motivated. The judge will only let them get so far with that defense. But if they don't say it expressly, they'll certainly infer to the jury that this is a minor violation and should never have been a criminal case from the start. This is probably an unfair question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. From what we know, can you tell if this jury is better for the prosecution or better for the defense? Well, I think we can say from the get-go that the defense was never going to be thrilled with this jury because this is a venue that is not particularly favorable to former President Trump. It's obviously in New York State. It's More than that, it's in Manhattan, where former President Trump is not particularly popular. So I think the defense is looking at this as an uphill climb. They're probably looking realistically to try to get at least one juror who would vote to acquit, and then they get a mistrial. The case has to be tried all over again. They're probably also looking to try to trip up the judge to create an issue on appeal. And at the end of the day, the defense's best play here is going to probably be to create a record that they can take up on appeal, because I think most people believe there will be a conviction at the end of this case. We will learn more on Monday when opening statements take place. Thanks so much, Bob. That's Robert Mintz of McCarter in English. Coming up, those January 6th obstruction charges. I'm June Grosso, and you're listening to Bloomberg. Federal prosecutors have brought obstruction charges against more than 350 defendants in January 6th cases, including two counts against Donald Trump for his efforts to overturn his election loss in 2020. But during oral arguments on Tuesday, several conservative Supreme Court justices like Neil Gorsuch expressed skepticism about the potential scope of the charge and the kinds of conduct it could criminalize. Would a sit-in that disrupts a trial or access to a federal courthouse qualify? Would a heckler in today's audience qualify or at the State of the Union address? Would pulling a fire alarm uh, um, before a vote qualify for 20 years in federal prison? The obstruction law has a broad catch-all provision that makes it a crime to corruptly obstruct, influence, or impede any official proceeding. And Joseph Fisher, a former Pennsylvania police officer and January 6th defendant, argues it was intended to prevent evidence tampering, not an insurrection. Justice Clarence Thomas, whose wife Ginny is a conservative activist who was at the rally on January 6th, asked the U.S. Solicitor General Elizabeth Prelogger if prosecutors had ever used the statute for other violent protests. Have you enforced it in that manner? We have enforced it in a variety of prosecutions that don't focus on evidence tampering. Now, I can't give you an example of enforcing it in a situation where people have violently stormed a building in order to prevent an official proceeding, a specified one, from occurring with all of the elements like intent to obstruct, knowledge of the proceeding, um, having the corruptly mens rea. But, but that's just because I'm not aware of that circumstance ever happening prior to January 6th. Joining me is former federal prosecutor Jessica Roth, a professor at Cardozo Law School. Jessica, explain what the issue is here. So the issue here is how to interpret the obstruction of an official proceeding statute, which is one of a series of statutes that address obstruction of justice in various forms. It's a particular provision that was enacted in 2002 as part of the Sarbanes-Oxley Act following the Enron scandal and the revelation of significant accounting fraud on the part of the accountants for Enron, and the revelation that although those involved in the shredding of documents related to Enron were prosecuted, that there was essentially a gap in the obstruction of justice statute because it was not possible to charge somebody for destroying evidence essentially on their own. The statutes required that a person 
direct or somehow get another person to destroy documents. And so it wasn't that there was so much a problem charging in the Enron case, but that it was identified that this could be a problem in future cases. And so the particular statute that was charged here against Mr. Fisher that's been used against over 300 defendants who are charged arising out of the January 6th insurrection, and that also is the basis for two of the charges against Donald Trump in the January 6th case against him. And the question is whether or not that statute can be used to charge a person for obstructing a proceeding, including a proceeding of Congress, where the destruction of evidence or tampering with evidence, per se, is not part of the factual allegation. Did it seem during the oral arguments that the conservative justices were skeptical about the Justice Department using the obstruction charge against Fisher and the other January 6th defendants? There were clearly some justices who were skeptical of the charges. I would say Justice Alito was the one who seemed most clearly skeptical. Chief Justice Roberts also expressed some concerns, although he did not ask that many questions. Justice Gorsuch had some concerns about the breadth of the potential application of the statute if the court were to rule for the government. There were several justices who seemed much more inclined to rule for the government, notably Justice Sotomayor, Justice Kagan, and Justice Katanji Brown-Jackson, all seemed supportive of the interpretation of the statute that the government was advancing. But then there were several justices who seemed sort of in the middle and open to persuasion. So I can't say with any confidence how this case is going to come out. Let's talk about some of the concerns of the very conservative justices on the far right of the court. So Justice Neil Gorsuch said, would a sit-in that disrupts a trial or access to a federal courthouse qualify? Would a heckler in today's audience qualify? Would pulling a fire alarm before a vote, referring to an incident in Congress that happened recently, Mm -hmm. qualify for 20 years in federal prison? So they were questioning the breadth, I guess, of this. A number of the justices asked questions and posed hypotheticals that really were geared at testing the outer limits of the construction of the statute that the government was advancing. And those did include hypothetical protests, for example, or somebody in some way disrupting an official proceeding, such as protesting outside a courthouse or pulling a fire alarm. And the justices wanted to know, well, would the government charge that person with obstruction of an official proceeding under its interpretation? And the Solicitor General responded by saying there are a number of safeguards in the statute that would preclude a prosecution in those circumstances. She said the obstruction or the impediment of the official proceeding, in a sense, must be more than de minimis. It has to actually, in some way that is not insignificant, impair the proceeding. And so that would be something that might preclude a prosecution for somebody who pulled a fire alarm that caused a disruption that was only a matter of minutes or that would preclude prosecution of protesters who only minimally disrupted a proceeding inside a courthouse, perhaps where things had to quiet down for a few minutes just to make sure that the protest was moving on and was peaceful. The second thing she said is that the mens rea requirement of the statute, which is that the person has to act corruptly, also would preclude prosecution of people in some of these hypotheticals because it would be unlikely that the government could prove that those people acted with corrupt intent, that is, doing something knowing that it was wrong and contrary to law. If people thought, for example, they were engaged in peaceful protests protected by the First Amendment, in some circumstances they might be wrong about whether their activity was protected by the First Amendment, but their belief that it was might preclude a finding that they acted with the requisite corrupt intent. So in other words, she said the court could rule in the government's favor on its interpretation of the statute as applied to official proceedings and not be worried about some of the sort of parade of horribles that the court seemed to be concerned about. A couple of justices seemed concerned about the stiff possible 20-year sentence this charge carries. And Justice Brett Kavanaugh brought up the six other charges that Fisher is facing. Why aren't those six counts good enough, just uh, from the Justice Department's perspective, given that they don't have any of the hurdles? I thought the Solicitor General's response to that question was actually quite compelling. She said, yes, he was charged with other counts, but that those other counts did not fully capture the harm of his conduct and that it was important that the charges reflect 
the harm that his conduct allegedly inflicted, which was impairing the official proceeding of the congressional certification of the Electoral College vote. And prosecutors frequently charge a number of offenses for one set of conduct in order to have the charges fully reflect the seriousness and the scope of the conduct. It is important to note that Fisher has not actually been tried yet, so I should qualify all of this with he has alleged to have done all of these things. This charge was dismissed by the trial court before it went to trial, and then that went up to the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals. And so there's actually a factual dispute among the parties about what exactly it is that Fisher did and how violent was he at the Capitol. If the court finds for Fisher here, what happens to the 120 or so January 6th defendants who've been convicted and sentenced under the same charge? So I'm fairly certain that no defendant associated with January 6th has been charged solely with this obstruction statute, that there were other charges for each of them. So those other convictions would stand, even if the court were to rule against the government here, and if the court were to rule that this obstruction statute cannot be used in the context of January 6th because it didn't involve destruction of evidence. So the defendants in those other cases would be resentenced. And even if the court rules for Fisher, Trump is facing two other charges. So the election interference trial against him could go forward. Jessica, what are your thoughts? Is the prosecution stretching the law with these January 6th obstruction charges? I think if you look at the statute and you follow the government's argument about how the statute can be read as applying to any means, of obstructing an official proceeding so long as the person acts with corrupt intent and this requisite nexus is satisfied, I think it is a fair interpretation of the statute that it applies to these facts. It is unprecedented, but that, I think, speaks to the fact that there's been no similar fact pattern where people have attempted to and did obstruct for a time an official proceeding through such acts of violence. So it is novel, but I don't think that it is beyond the pale of what is covered by this statute. The government could try something else. And Justice Amy Coney Barrett asked Fisher's lawyer about whether the government could argue that there was evidence being tampered with and that evidence was the certifications of the vote. So in the hypothetical I'm giving you, it's evidence related because it's focused on the certificates, but it's obstruct. Um, obstruct or impede, say, the certificates arriving to the vice president's desk insofar as the goal was to shut down the proceeding and therefore interfere with the evidence reaching the vice president. I do think we'd be getting into some very interesting territory if the court were to say that it's finding for Fisher and the statute cannot be read beyond applications involving evidence and whether the government then seeks to apply the statute so limited to the facts presented here. The government said in a footnote in its brief, and it reiterated at the argument, that it would like the opportunity to argue that even under such a narrowed construction, that the facts can meet that construction because the proceeding before Congress involved the counting of the electoral vote, and that involved essentially the evidence of the votes presented to Congress. That's, I think, going to be very interesting to think about whether that application strains the statute too much. And that is precisely the argument that has been advanced by some watching the Fisher case for its significance for the case against Donald Trump on the theory that if the court rules against the government in Fisher and says that acts of violence to obstruct an official proceeding do not fall within the statute, could a sort of backup argument be that the electoral vote being certified in the course of that proceeding before Congress, that that could be essentially the hook to the documentary evidence that would be required to satisfy the statute. That's actually an intriguing theory if the government loses here. We'll see. Thanks so much, Jessica, for your insights. That's Professor Jessica Roth of Cardozo Law School. Coming up next on the Bloomberg Law Show, will the Supreme Court limit a bribery law used in public corruption cases? I'm June Grosso, and you're listening to Bloomberg.
The Supreme Court has consistently been making it harder for prosecutors to bring corruption cases against public officials, and it may do so again in a case heard this week. James Snyder, the former mayor of a northwest Indiana town, received $13,000 from a trucking company one month after it was awarded city contracts in a bidding process he oversaw. Snyder claimed the payment was for consulting services, but he was convicted of bribery by a jury in 2019 and then convicted by a second jury in a retrial in 2021. But the Supreme Court, which has been having its own problems of late with unreported gifts to justices, seemed to suggest that the $13,000 payment was like taking a teacher to the Cheesecake Factory or buying a gift card for Starbucks. Here are Justices Neil Gorsuch and Brett Kavanaugh. How does somebody who accepts the Cheesecake Factory know a trip to the Cheesecake Factory for nice treatment at the hospital, for treating my child well in school, for uh, an arrest made? How does that person know whether that falls on the what you call the wrongfulness side of the equation or not? So does a $100 Starbucks gift certificate as a thank you to the city council person who, for working on a new zoning reg, uh, is that um, corrupt or not? Many of the justices thought there was a problem drawing a line between gratuities given for past actions and quid pro quo bribes paid for future actions. But Justice Sonia Sotomayor saw the line in the Snyder case. Here's a case in which someone is, that's the allegation, demanding money, gets it basically for no services, spends his time giving two or three different reasons and services that he performed, which he didn't. Um, And there's a series of meetings or uh, phone calls, texts, et cetera, before the second contract is awarded between these people. At some point, can't the jury see that as a demand for payment for services? Joining me to answer that question and many others is business law professor Eric Talley of Columbia Law School. The law makes it a crime for certain state or local officials to corruptly accept anything of value over $5,000. The word corruptly seemed to be a problem for the justices. Yes, and the key issue on the question of corruptly seems to be, at least in part, circulating around a question of timing. And a lot of the Q&A during the oral argument was all about, you know, the timing of a payment that, let's just say for argument's sake, exceeds $5,000. But the hypotheticals that were being bandied about involve situations like taking someone out to dinner at the Cheesecake Factory. I don't know if you've been to the Cheesecake Factory <laughs> lately, but Not lately. I've never run up anything like a $500 bill at the Cheesecake Factory, so it wouldn't actually hit that statutory threshold. Well, Kavanaugh said, you don't know if the concert tickets, the game tickets, the gift card to Starbucks, whatever, where is the line? So there's that vagueness. I mean, are they really talking about a more than $5,000 gift card to Starbucks? Super odd. I mean, just sort of my brought this up, but this question of corruptly ended up floating around in its own mist, right, independent of the dollar amount. Look, a lot of times in these situations, there will be either inside the statute or kind of a reasonable construction of the statute. A judge will come in and say, listen, we're going to impose a, you know, it's sometimes called a materiality threshold or a materiality test on some sort of suspect payment. And the definition of materiality is itself, it's a little foggy. It usually circulates around, you know, would a reasonable person think this is a big payment that would change someone's judgment? But that has worked all over the place in all types of financial crimes and financial civil actions. Materiality is a very, very common workhorse that was oddly, it wasn't quite absent, but it seemed to be suppressed pretty far down the list in the oral argument. Where were the justices going with hypothetical after hypothetical after hypothetical? Much of the oral argument seemed to devolve into like kind of a nonstop set of hypotheticals, each somewhat more extraordinary than the others, 
And, you know, that kind of is where the two lawyers had to go. Now, I think the lawyer for Mr. Snyder was quite happy to go there because the entire theory on the case is it's just impossible to draw lines in this type of a situation. And the government's attorneys pretty much had to say, no, line drawing is hard, but it's always hard. And the government's going to only bring these cases when it feels like it's a good case that's consistent with public policy associated with the anti-bribery statute. But that itself, you know, at least to some judges and maybe to some observers is a type of assurance that's really hard to check later on. And so, you know, I think the court's probably going to have to be forced into some sort of a line drawing exercise here. The big issue that was brought up in the case was in this particular scenario, and even Kavanaugh said the facts were really good for the government prosecutors in this case. Mr. Snyder had allegedly sort of rigged a contract bidding process when he was mayor of Portage, Indiana. And the company that won won that bidding process he had been in consistent contact with. And then pretty shortly after the contract was awarded to them, they handed over a $13,000 check, ostensibly for consulting services to be provided in the future. And so the line drawing exercise between his administration of the bidding process and the $13,000 check seems pretty direct. But the point that his attorneys were making, they were making quite vehemently at the court, is that, well, no, this would have to be payments that are made before the favor is granted and not after. And this came afterwards. And there are too many hypothetical situations that would lead us on. You know, lawyers like to talk about slippery slopes to hell. And and this was one. And that's what caused us to go into the dinner out of gratitude for your high school English teacher at the Cheesecake Factory. Is, Is that a bribe? So the government's attorney suggested that the government typically wouldn't prosecute fringe cases. But Chief Justice Roberts noted that in recent cases, the court has been skeptical of prosecutors' trust us arguments. What are the justices afraid of here? Well, I think there is a justified caution about statutory authorizations that give prosecutors too much of a blank check in what they're going to charge people with. If the check is too much of a blank check, then it's not inconceivable that political calculations may end up either entering or being perceived to have entered into a prosecutor's decision about whom to go after and whom to leave alone. And so I think that that's part of what the court has been trying to grapple with. And, you know, in fairness, there have been several high-profile cases involving various types of applications of this and other anti-bribery or anti-corruption statutes in which politics is pretty hard to ignore. There was a 2020 case that involved the infamous Bridgegate scenario in which Chris Christie was alleged to have had his subordinates close down the GW Bridge in order to punish his political foes. And then the prosecution was brought, at least allegedly, for political reasons, sort of anti-Chris Christie, anti-Republican reasons. And the Supreme Court ended up actually reversing that conviction, but on kind of weird technical grounds grounds about what was motivating these operatives. So they sort of found maybe even unrelated fault reasons to reverse in some of these cases. And, you know, that may be what is being put forward here, this kind of idea that, well, if the payment happens after the political favor is given, then that can't possibly be corruption. That's a nice bright line rule. You know, as the government lawyers were bringing up, probably correctly, is that if you establish that as a a bright line rule, that will be kind of a gold embossed invitation for how you should structure corruption payments. Payments in the future, right? That you know, you always have the political actor go first, wait some you know requisite short amount of time, and then the payment comes second. And in some ways, the ease with which one could engineer around that type of a definition, I think, is going to make it difficult for a majority of the judges to ignore that. The Supreme Court over the years has made it harder and harder to prosecute politicians and other public officials for corruption, starting in 2016, right? Yeah, the skepticism goes at least back to a 2016 case, and there have been several others, both at the federal level and the state level. And so there is a little bit of a, I guess it's sort of a trend here where the judges have become I don't know, increasingly worried about the possibility that these anti-bribery or anti-corruption statutes are being used for political reasons, and therefore, you know, they're trying to carve back on them. You know, I guess another factor of this is sort of almost a meta factor, June, which is that one of the bodies of the federal government that has come under immense scrutiny recently is the Supreme Court itself for whether there are friends of justices of the Supreme Court who bestow um, all kinds of valuable gifts on them out of friendship or for people they care about, and whether that itself 
is something that should trigger at least suspicion, if not considerable hand-wringing amongst people who are trying to regulate the court. There's big separation of powers issues, and the Supreme Court itself basically decided to promulgate its own ethics guideline, but a lot of people think it's somewhat toothless. It is not a subtle fact that Justice Thomas, who's been one of the people who's been at the center of this maelstrom, decided not to even participate in the oral argument, but he is going to participate in the judgment through briefs and through reading the transcript. That was sort of an odd decision that didn't really have much of an explanation. So, you know, I think all aspects of this are in some ways delicate. And I think the Supreme Court itself has gotten dragged a little bit into its own kerfuffles around when are expressions of gratitude that may have significant monetary value, when are they appropriate, and when do they trigger considerations and concerns about corruption and bribery. And Eric, these public corruption cases are hard to prosecute, aren't they? You know, public officials and these kind of bribes, they don't leave notes or emails saying, thanks so much for that. I was happy to help you out. Yet, typically they don't. There have been some cases that have largely been overturned that sort of said, well, you have to have a written contract on bribery. And I think everyone (laughs) realizes that that's an easy one to engineer your way around. So you have to demonstrate either a conversation or a set of conversations that establishes this understanding or a set of patterns and practices of behavior whose only reasonable construction or interpretation would be, yeah, these folks are acting as though they are in a quid pro quo, that they are recognized recognizing through either their communicative acts or hard to misinterpret action. And that makes it tough. And Eric, if the court doesn't decide on a bright line rule based on when the money was paid, how else could the court decide this considering some of their concerns about Starbucks cards and Cheesecake Factory meals? I think that most of the absurd situations involved little perks that are kind of pocket change type perks. And that once things got large, including the $5,000 trigger in this situation, then that would be large enough to trigger not only the explicit trigger, but also a judicial interpretation that, yes, this is large enough that it could affect someone's judgment. And that's one of the reasons why I feel like the court may well end up borrowing from a half dozen, if not more than a dozen other areas of financial fraud and white collar crime that all sort of turns on materiality. And that may end up being a helpful lever for the Supreme Court when they try to decide this case. If they don't go with the timing part, they're going to have to have some sort of a cutoff. And a materiality cutoff is not a crazy place to put it. That's why you see it so many other areas of law. Thanks for joining me, Eric. That's Professor Eric Talley of Columbia Law School. And that's it for this edition of the Bloomberg Law Podcast. Remember, you can always get the latest legal news by subscribing and listening to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and at Bloomberg.com slash podcast slash law. I'm June Grosso, and this is Bloomberg.